I want to thank all of our alumni, students, parents, and friends of the Price School for joining us this evening. We're really thrilled to be able to bring you this truly special event organized by the USC Price Real Estate Alumni and Affiliates Group. First and foremost, please join me right at the beginning in thanking Rick Caruso for hosting us at the Grove tonight. Thank you, Rick. Rick, we are incredibly grateful for your support. You've shown the Price School over the years and especially this evening as well. Thank you. I would also like to thank the Caruso staff, especially Michael Gazzano, Caruso's Vice President of Development and a dedicated Price alumnus and Price Real Estate alumni and Affiliates Council member. I just learned that uh, my son Alex interviewed him uh, when he was trying to apply to the Price School. So. Uh, little connection there. Tonight we are incredible, incredibly fortunate to hear from two giants of the real estate industry who not surprisingly are both USC Trojans. But before we hear from our special guest, I want to share some updates about the USC Price School's real estate program. We are proud to announce that last month a US News and World Report ranked the USC Price School number two in the nation in public affairs, and number one in the subcategory of urban policy. It's a direct result of our remarkable impact and long history of leadership in the fields of urban economics and real estate development. For our alumni, this should come, I guess, as no surprise, as USC Price has been at the forefront of real estate education and re research for more than 30 years. From our renowned Dollinger Master of Real Estate Development degree, the MRED degree, our dual degree program with the Price MRED and the MBA degree with the Marshall School of Business, to our Bachelor of Real Estate Development degree launched just three years ago, USC Price has been producing accomplished graduates who have gone on to become respective leaders in the real estate industry. We also lead the country in research on real estate, urban economics, and policy through the esteemed Lust Center for Real Estate, a truly remarkable center that connects the real estate industry with scholars, students, and policymakers alike. The Dollinger MRED program is, in my view, the very best in the country. And to me, the true measure of that claim can only be seen by the accomplishments of our alumni who have gone on to apply their knowledge to make enormous contributions to the industry and to communities, not only here in Southern California, but really in every major metropolitan area in the United States and around the globe. As I mentioned, in 2015, we reconstituted our undergraduate concentration in real estate in a, into a new bachelor in real estate development degree affectionately now known as the BRED degree, to meet the growing interest and demand from our undergraduates. Could I see a show of hands of how many BRED students might be here tonight? All right, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm sure the alumni would agree that what you learn from your professional network and from events like this one are just as important at what is what you learn in the classroom. The BRED program offers the most comprehensive undergraduate real estate education in the country. All facets of real estate development, finance, and investment are covered while simultaneously providing students with a solid understanding of the broader context in which real estate operates. As both programs expand and grow, the power of the USC Price alumni network grows with it. So this past fall, we launched the Price Real Estate Alumni and Affiliates, which provides alumni with a place to connect, network, and participate in professional development opportunities throughout their career. So we encourage you to join the alumni network, as there will be many more opportunities like this one tonight. 
and to join, please refer to the postcard we've placed in your, at your seats or in your gift bag. Let me conclude with just a few words about the importance of understanding the broader context in real estate education and research at the Price School. It is our belief that real estate is a special kind of business with a fundamental impact on people and communities where people live, work, and play. For developers, each deal, each financial investment and decision shapes the look and structure of communities and neighborhoods which determines the quality of life for people and families. Each developer and investor shapes the commercial structure, design, and skyline of commercial and retail districts, and some help to shape the industrial corridors that provide economic lifeblood for our cities. So real estate developers deal with planning commissions, entitlements, policy regulations, zoning, as well as financing and deal making. They must understand community relationships, especially within fill development projects. Real estate is not done in a vacuum. It has an impact on land use, transportation, health, the environment, local government, and the community. So if you want to do good real estate, you must do it in context. Now, Rick Caruso, you may not remember this, and I hope he still agrees with it, uh, once told me that his, one of his comparative advantages was that he understood better than his competition how government bureaucracy, regulations, and entitlement processes work, as well as understanding design and community processes and interests. These, I believe, are wise words from a renowned industry leader. And this particular comparative advantage that he noted is also a valuable component of the Price School's real estate programs. And there is no doubt in my mind that USC Price's number one ranking in urban policy is a direct result of the Price School's holistic approach to real estate research and education. So I want to thank you all for being a part of the USC Price School su success. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn the conversation over to our panelists. Lou Horn and Rick Caruso are both longtime dedicated Trojans who have risen to the very top of the real estate industry. They make an impact in Southern California and beyond really every day. Over the years, both have influenced our programs in real estate by hiring our students and alumni and being involved on various Price School advisory boards. So I want to thank you, Lou, for supporting our students through internships and through full-time positions. Uh, we very much appreciate that and for serving on our undergraduate advisory board. And thank you, Rick, uh, for serving as a dedicated and longtime member of the Price School's Board of Counselors and obviously also on the USC Board of Trustees. Rick has generally host, generously hosted us at his prop properties on more than one occasion and has become a true friend and advisor. Rick is also the proud parent of a Price School real estate undergraduate alumnus. So thank you both uh, for joining us this evening and being a part of the USC Price School family. It means a great deal to us. To get the conversation started, please welcome our moderator for the evening, Roger Vincent. Roger has covered commercial real estate for the Los Angeles Times since 1996. He is a longtime observer of the industry who served as the first real estate columnist, columnist at the Los Angeles Business Journal in the mid-1980s. And he was also founding editor of the California Real Estate Journal. And we're really pleased to have him here with us tonight. So would you please join me in welcoming Roger Vincent, Rick Caruso, and Lou Horn. Good evening. It's so great to be here. Uh, I've known these gentlemen for a long time and uh, was pleased to jump at the chance to, to be here with you and, and hear what they have to say because, because they're both innovators in this field. I've been covering commercial real estate, as you heard, since the mid-1980s. And I've seen a lot of changes, and this is, this is a very exciting time that we're in. 
uh, there's so much development changing the city in a way, it, it was something that, that it wasn't before. Uh, I just had a meeting before I came over here about a new, another billion dollar project that's coming to Los Angeles I'll be able to write about next week. So it's just amazing how much is going on here. Uh, both of these guys have been at the forefront. Uh, Lou is an innovator in, in many ways, but in particular I'm thinking of the uh, dockless office, I guess we're untethered with their words we've used for where nobody has an assigned desk. Uh, I wrote a story about that that was uh, that went all over the world. People, the, maybe the one story I wrote that got the most eyeballs for some people just fascinated by this idea and uh, being able to show clients that this is how it's done. Uh, I heard about Rick uh, back when somebody said came to me and said there's this guy who's going to build this thing called the Grove at Farmer's Market. And I guess it had to be at Farmer's Market because nobody knew where it was. Now people think that the Farmer's Market is that thing at the Grove. I, <laughs> Don't tell it open. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was I could say, see he was innovative because there was a, a computer simulation that came with the pitch. That, I had, that was a brand new thing where you could kind of cruise through it. And then there was a really high level jingle called Meet Me at the Grove at Farmer's Market. <laughs> And it's such an earworm that it's still stuck in my head. <laughs> and I'll probably die re remembering that thing. Someday we're going to play it back for you, so you have to remember it, too. Uh, but these guys have known each other a long time, so maybe we should jump right in. Uh, how did you meet? I, was it at school? Was it? Where did you get together? Can we start? Why don't you start? Then I'll, I'll clean it up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll clean it up. Okay. We're going to keep this clean. Lou and I met at USC. Uh, we were both the class of 80, mm -hmm. and um, we, uh, I was already in a fraternity, and Lou was, uh, came to SC a little bit later. He was a transfer student and um, came in, and he became a pledge, and we became actives together and best friends, and we've been best friends ever since, so it's been a good 40 years, and I'm not going to get into any of the details <laughs> in between. <laughs> Thank we're, you. We have a room of, particularly with there, Roger Vincent. There's a lot right? of, yeah, there's a lot of silly, ugly That's stuff that record. happened. I would say the first time I saw Rick, I, it was my very first night at USC, and we, I walked into this little bar, a restaurant, Bergen's, <laughs> right, yeah. Bergen's? Right. And there was a whole table there, and a bunch of people sitting around, and Rick was the chairman of the board of this, of this small group, and it was just a lot of fun. And from there, um, we actually, he was the president of the fraternity and I became the pledge trainer and it really upset me because he got a $50 stipend and I didn't get anything. I was really upset by that. So he was making money even in college. Yeah. <laughs> Did you haze each other? And then? Well, I don't know if I would call it hazing. We had a lot of fun. We still have a lot of fun. Here's the great thing, and this is one of the powers that everybody here knows about SC, is because of us meeting at SC, and you transferred, you were a junior? Junior, When yeah. you transferred? And um, completely different backgrounds, completely different worlds, became best friends very quickly. But now, our wives are best friends, our kids are best friends, we take all our vacations together. There's a group of about six families, all of us were in the fraternity together, all the wives are best friends, literally all the kids are best friends. And when we go on vacation together, there's literally a party of 30. So we're this traveling party wherever we go. And that's a remarkable thing that USC provides. So, but we we um, we did some damage to each other, but it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't hazing, and we continued to. Well, how did you decide to get into real estate? Was that something you wanted to do as a small child, or did you want to be an astronaut and then find it later on? What was the? You know, I always wanted to be in real estate. I would tell my father I wanted to be in real estate. My dad was in the car business. I didn't. I love cars. I still love cars, but I didn't want to be in the car business. And um, I was encouraged strongly to go to law school by my dad. I was actually told to go to law school by my dad. It was great advice, uh, same advice they gave my oldest son who just graduated law school. And um, practiced law for about six years, but I always wanted to get into real estate and started by buying a duplex. And I was the gardener and the painter and the leasing agent. And I'm gonna just tell you a quick story that really shaped my career. So this is a little duplex on the corner of Midvale and Massachusetts and Westwood. Sort of picture where that is, right? Sort of near where Bristol Farms is along Westwood, one block in. And I would go there literally, water the lawn, paint the whole thing. And I cleaned it up. My grandfather was a gardener, so I was really into gardening. And I put all these really cool little flowers out and we painted the place, got it all cleaned up. And there was an, a, a duplex across the street that had a unit for lease. 
and I had mine for lease, and I was the leasing agent there on a Saturday, right? And this guy comes over and says, yours is much more than across the street, so I'm going to rent the place across the street. And I said, that's fine. But I said, mine has fresh paint, and I have all these nice flowers, and the lawn is beautiful. Every morning, you're going to wake up and open the door, <laughs> and you're going to look at this, and it's going to ruin your day. If you want to lease across the street, go ahead. But it really fashioned my idea of how you create value by some of the simplest things that you do, like just make something nice, right? It, you know, what I do is really not rocket science. And that's really where I learned a lot is this little duplex. How about you, Lou? When did you decide you wanted to be in real estate? First of all, he had a fountain in the front of his duplex. <laughs> it was really cool. Trolley around, <laughs> Trolley around the duplex. No. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to train. <laughs> uh, no, I, I was with IBM at right, out, at right out of college, and I had actually moved down here because I wanted to start a pet business, and I wanted to open up a chain of pet stores, and that's why I, met, I went to SC. There was an entrepreneurial program there, and I was focused on that, wrote my paper, and met Rick and decided I didn't want to go into the pet business anymore, so I elevated my expectations. But I joined IBM, and then after I was there for four years, uh, I had some friends that had gone to the original Coldwell Banker, and so I became an industrial broker there for about 12, 14 years. So. Did you wear short sleeve shirts with ties? <laughs> no. <laughs> I did have a little pen saver, though, maybe. We don't want to talk about his clothes <laughs> when he <laughs> came, <we> go. <laughs> came to SC. Yeah. He was from Sacramento. It was a little bit different. <laughs> hey, I'm from Sacramento. I actually, I have to... Sa then you'll understand. <laughs> yeah. I think at my first day, I was in a blue jean jumpsuit, right? With, with crayon shoes. <laughs> you've... you've You've done well. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what made you decide to build the Grove then? I remember you were people were known for doing nice work out in the valley, but right. what was the... You know, it, it was an evolution, Roger. The first project I ever built is right down the street here. We call 333. It's where Lomans was. And now we're going to redevelop that to a high-rise um, residential rental building, similar to what we did across the street at 8500. I did that. Then I went out to Encino, did Encino Marketplace, then went out to Thousand Oaks and did a couple out in Thousand Oaks. And so every, every property, if you sort of follow that chain, evolved. And then I literally got a call as I was building the commons at Calabasas that there was potentially a real estate deal here with the Gilmore family that had owned the market for many, many years. And I called cold and um, came in, and the head of the family, uh, Hank Hilty, who's a great guy, said, I'm pretty much done with the deal. Now, this property, 10 years before that, was designed, slated, and after a long, intensive battle through the city of Los Angeles over an EIR, was going to be an indoor mall anchored by Nordstrom and J.C. Penney. I mean, it would have just been the most horrifying thing <laughs> next, to the, next to the farmer's market. And when the real estate market crashed in the 80s, that project crashed. If you remember JMB out of Chicago, that was their project. And so um, he had another deal. I pitched him, and he said, I'll give you two weeks. Come up with an idea. And I literally had no idea what we were going to do. Came back to the team, and I was on a plane about a week later. And in the United Magazine, it had a picture of a double-decker trolley from Hong Kong. And that's what spurred the idea of putting a trolley, sort of celebrating the history of railroad in Los Angeles, the trolley system. And psychologically and physically connecting the Grove to the market that I knew that the Gilmore family would appreciate and open up because the mall turned it back on the market. And we designed it literally um, as a completely different model that nobody had done before. Not that we were smarter. I think that we were in many ways less informed that I, had I grown up in the mall industry, I would have built a mall. Having not grown up in the mall industry, I didn't want to build a mall. I wanted to build something that I thought I would enjoy and other people would enjoy. And that uh, created the Grove. When I first started writing about the Grove, I asked people about this guy, Rick Caruso, and they told me, well, he's a good developer, but he overspends. And you can't make any money that way. I don't think it's turned out quite that way. <laughs> uh, Thank gosh. Yeah. yeah. So, but what? Now, uh, also, uh, legend has it that you picked out the tiles and the paint and all the everything. Yes, do all that stuff. I have a lot of good help, trust me. 
back in the day when the company was smaller, you know, obviously did a lot more. But I'm still involved. I was up in Miramar today, and um, I was rotating. This sounds weird. I was rotating the trees that were being brought in um, and pivoting the trees on every location around the site. We only got about six trees done today. But um, I like the details. I think the details are fun. I love the creative side of the details. And it's part of what motivates me. And the Palisades were doing the same thing. What it's a fun business. It's a fun business. What did you, what did you learn? What, what, is there anything that didn't work the first time when you tried it at the Grove that you came away from thinking differently? Yeah, you know, I think at every project we've done, uh, obviously I'm proud of what we've built. There's always things you'd like to do better. You know, you strive for perfection, but you never want perfect to get in the way of good. And, um, you know, I look back at the Grove. A lot of people thought that Third Street was going to be the big calling card and uh, people would want their front door on Third Street. It turned out that this crazy idea of a trolley, all the retailers required to be adjacent to the trolley. It's actually a condition of the lease with American Girl that the trolley runs. I mean, it's the craziest thing. The trolley, by the way, is the shortest licensed railroad in the state of California. <laughs> wow. Thank, thank God for California having laws. <laughs> It's a licensed railroad. It goes 1,600 feet. It's full every day, and it goes nowhere. It, it's, it's, it's remarkable, I mean, right? And you own two of them, right? And we own two of them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're the biggest railroader but, in California. Yeah. <laughs> but if there was something I would do different, um, I would have built residential here like we did at Americana. We learned that lesson, and that's why we did it at Americana. And then, you know, fortunately with Lou, uh, with the Masonic Temple, he was – the catalyst and the seed to the idea of buying the Masonic and converting that to the office space that Lou's become famous for out there. So that was a great collaboration. Yeah, it was the first fun. time we actually worked together. Yeah. Can you tell us about that office, Lou? Well, our leader, David Josker, is the one that actually put the deal together. But uh, we had that story that you referenced earlier. We had our global corporate headquarters in downtown LA, and our CEO had come to me and said, we want to try this new idea that we saw in Amsterdam but we need to do it in the U.S. It's never been done before. So I said, okay, if we can convince me, because I've got 200 people in this office that are all very competitive brokers and our competition's trying to, to recruit them all the time, but it's gotta be perfect. So I started on this journey. I went all over the world. I looked at about 30 sites and ultimately came down with three key elements of what we did there, which ultimately led us to the Americana. Um, the first one was we, this idea of free address, which you wrote that article on. Uh, and that was, means basically you're using your technology. So because you can store all your file cabinet on your iPad, we didn't have file cabinets, we didn't use paper, and everybody could just use the kind of space that they needed for the day based on the work that they were doing that day. So instead of working in a cube or an office or a, a conference room, you could work in 16 different areas. We also made it a healthy environment. So there was everybody got a shot through the window. It was circadian lighting at night that, or during the day that actually adjusts to the amount of sunlight that you get. There's cork substrates under the floors that make it healthier. There's sit-stand desks all over the place. We planted a thousand plants inside of the place, and, and that was that article that you wrote, uh, which ultimately went viral. We've, in five years now, we have opened 55 more of those, uh, and we have another 27 under construction globally, and we've changed the way we occupy space. We've also changed the way our clients now are occupying space. So you look at every expansion in downtown, or in, in, in LA right now, most of the office space is expanding, but they're actually contracting in space because they're free address. It's where you know, you're able to just get incredible fi efficiencies because of the, because of the um, technology. We also made it, um, we, have a, we have a deal where you, at night, because of the wellness piece, they'll bring in, in uh, ultraviolet light and they burn off all of the desks, the phones, the keyboards, just to make it a healthier environment. And then every one of our offices has got a local street artist. So we interviewed street artists out of East LA. We interviewed 10 of them. We picked one, Augustine Coffee, and he built this beautiful mural. And so that's our signature. We'll, we believe that we've got an international network, but you've got to have local market knowledge, and that's why we've used as really a signature for us now, that local artist. So we were really on a roll there, and um, I, we, we, were, we were moving our valley office, and. Um, I just, we, we were looking at traditional space. I was really excited about what we had occupied there. And I saw this Masonic temple across the street. Dave's team showed it to me, and I thought this could be really cool. And I called Rick, and I said, I've got this crazy idea. 
He said, the building has not been occupied for 50 years, right. doesn't have any parking, right. doesn't have any windows. Right. It's more like a grain silo inside than it is an office building. Right. Right. But it was dirt floors and dead pigeons. And ultimately, Rick said, oh, that's really interesting. Let me take a look. He goes, I love crazy ideas. So two weeks later, he called me and said, hey, Louie, I bought a building. <laughs> And he was halfway through construction before we signed the lease. So it really was a handshake deal. And yeah. it really turned out to be probably now the most photographed office building in the world. It's a cool building. It's well, there's also, um, do you, you want to go through the services? No, no, go. Services. Go, you, you experience it better than I do. So no, here, I mean that seriously. This was, here's this, the, the creative nature of Rick Caruso, and I'll compliment him because we actually now have a team. We're looking at doing this for a lot of our uh, clients all over the world, occupiers and investors. But the space was too far east. So we needed, we were in Burbank, and we were actually in Universal City. We, it was too far east, about 20 minutes too far east. So Rick basically listened to that and then got our entire team together and said, I got this idea. If you give me the 20 minutes, I'll give you back an hour. And there's this whole idea around concierge. So you pull in in the morning. So concierge takes your car, gases it up, puts air in the tires if you need it, changes the oil, cleans it up. Also, if you need uh, takeout for the night to take home, or if you need your tailoring done, or if you, it's basically a whole set of concierge services that all our employees, we had a employee about, right after we moved in, he had a, he bought a house and there was a bunch of bees behind the drywall and he couldn't figure out how to get rid of the bees. So somebody said, call Caruso Concierge. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he sent beekeepers out to this guy's house and they transported the bees. And so that story went viral and it ultimately has created this environment where people want to work in that building. And so it's just, it just shows the genius of what he's done on retail and in residential and also on office now. Are you all familiar with that building? It's right across the street from the Americana on Brand. It's the 1920s. Uh, it was built in 29. I think it was 29. Uh, a uh, Masonic temple that had, it was full for ceremony, so it was all closed off. There were no windows anywhere. No windows. A, yeah. yeah. I Very know. unusual building that's now pretty cool looking. I heard that there are, well, I, I've, I saw one of them. There was a, a treadmill desk in mm -hmm. your office downtown. I understand that you needed more. Of this. Do you have some brokers that think that's a good way to work? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, the, the idea around wellness, we just don't want people sitting in the same position all day. So we've got, we put 50 components of wellness into the space. It was the first well-certified space in the world. We worked with a group out of New York called Delos. So it was, you know, there was kind of sunlight, the air you're breathing is cleaner, the, there's water coolers every 15 feet. We've got, there's just a lot of components that make it a healthier space. And so one of those was treadmill desks so that people could take a two and a half mile an hour walk while they're on a conference call or, you know. And so the idea is you're, you're in a different position constantly so you don't have the same back issues or health issues that, that you would have in a, a traditional office space. I keep trying to get Rick to do it, but have you seen his office? <laughs> <laughs> We're looking at it. <laughs> We're looking at it. You're much more innovative than I am. No, it's, I think it's I think it's brilliant. I think there's a whole bunch of things that you've done that have changed the office industry, which is great. And we are looking at a bunch of that stuff because we need to expand our corporate office. And we're trying to figure out where we're going to go and what we're going to do. So it's one of the things to do list. <laughs> uh, can you tell me anything about the uh, decision to move into Glendale? How did that come to pass? That the Americana was the next move. Sure. The city of Glendale put out an RFP, I think it was at the time, or an RFQ. And they had four city blocks that they had acquired during redevelopment years when the cities could do that. South Glendale, where we are today, uh, the south of downtown, was really run down. And um, they had gone out some years before. Uh, Donahue Schreiber had won. At the time, they owned the mall next door, the, the Galleria. Donahue Shriver didn't perform. They went back out for a search, and we were fortunate enough to buy it. A lot of people thought we were nuts on Glendale, uh, that Glendale was long forgotten. Pasadena had taken it over as a market in terms of the better retail and the restaurants. And all of that was true. Pasadena, it had moved that way. What I looked at Glendale and I said is I've got some of the – the best neighborhoods in the in the county. I've got Los Feliz, I've got Atwater, I got Silver Lake, I have La Cañada, I have North Glendale that's incredible. I got five freeways, I have this whole system. Think about the Grove, it broke a lot of rules in a lot of ways, but we don't have a freeway that serves us. So if you wanna be super regional, which the Grove is, we pull from 87 zip codes, you really need freeways. We don't have it here. 
Glendale had all of that. And um, the city of Glendale has been magical to work with. They have been from the beginning. And um, they really wanted to create a place where people live and work and play and recreate right in the downtown. And we were fortunate enough to do it. It was a big battle. The mall fought us for many, many years, uh, general growth. Uh, we won all the way to the Supreme Court. Then it went to election. We had to win the election. And then they tried to block tenants, and we sued them, and we won. So it was so it's pretty easy then. It was pretty easy, <laughs> yeah. It was crazy. I mean, these indoor mall guys are nuts, but um, they are. They, you know, it's just you're, you're riding the Titanic. I mean, change direction. But um, their, the way they wanted to change direction was to stop competition. And we were, we were very fortunate that we were able to, to get it through. The, the Americana now is in the top 15 shopping districts in the world. Uh, rated by Fortune magazine, so we're very happy. Grove is number two, and so we're proudly the only development company that owns two in the top 15. And you got your housing there. And we got our housing there. And the, the condos have done very well. The residential runs at like 98 percent, and um, it's it's just it's really been a great experience and a great learning experience. And the food offering out there is incredible. Yeah. But Glendale, the city of Glendale, I think the trick in in our business, who's ever in this development business that the dean also referenced in his comments, to have a partnership that's a healthy partnership with a city, with your municipality that you're doing business with, is really critical. If you want to do great work, you know, they can really make it work. Masonic Temple, I went to the city manager. As Roger said, this building, at Lou said, hadn't been occupied in 50 years. There was no power, there was no water, there was no elevator, there were no windows, and it was historic. Crazy idea, and, uh, and we I, had to be in in nine months. And he had to I be had in, to in nine months. He said, penalty. "I have to put people behind a desk in nine months." I went to the city manager and I said, "We have an opportunity to move one of the great real estate companies in the world into your city. Are you with me?" He said, "Yes," and we built that thing in nine months and turned the keys over to him, and people were filling up their desks. I mean, it was it was a while. But ride. I got I got to describe the vision when we first went to that site. And Dave's smiling up there. Uh, by the way, not a lot of people wanted to do this, right? They didn't want it. The, the building, you know, they didn't have the vision that Rick had. Um, so Rick had flown a drone. We had bused 200 people at this to the site. He had flown a drone around the building. He put he built these 20 foot by 20 foot canvases of what the view would look like if you were looking out of this concrete bunker and put lighting on that carpeted the dirt floors. <laughs> and then it was just an unbelievable, stunning presentation of what it could be based on what it was. And then we went out and we had a drink across the street. And at night, he had a guy in the bushes shining a CBRE logo on the top of the building. <laughs> <laughs> you got to sell. <laughs> and everybody just said, <laughs> we're <Always> in. Sell. <laughs> <laughs> we're in. My dad was a car dealer. <laughs> sell. <laughs> You, needed you know, it's the old there. rule, get the guy in the car. Oh. You want to sell a car, learn that from my dad. We were have in him the sit car. in the car. And I will tell you, we, our people, it is, we had a team out there today from New York. Virtually everybody that does one of these now in our company, we have 500 offices all over the world, and we've done about half of the square footage in this new format. They all come to the Americana. They all want to see the services. They all want to see the massage. Yeah, if anybody wants a tour out there, yeah. let us, let me know, yeah. me know or Lou. Will. Yeah. Good job. Well, we're we're going to move to questions from the audience shortly, but I was hoping you could hold forth a little bit. You mentioned somebody being on the wrong track here in terms of indoor malls. Can you talk a little <laughs> bit about the future of, of the business? Now? You know, I'm, I'm happy to. I'm obviously opinionated about this. <laughs> um, and I'm not opinionated because I'm angry about it, because, you know, all these guys have sued to stop us. They tried to stop the Grove. Talman, who owns the Beverly Center, tried to stop the Grove when I was building the Grove. But... Um, about six or seven years ago, I gave a speech at NRF, the National Retail Foundation. And it's not that I have a crystal ball, but I said the indoor mall is going to die unless completely reinvented. It's an anachronism, and it is. It's not consistent with the way people live. It worked for a moment in time. And you have seen over the last decade declining foot traffic and declining sales in indoor malls. That's just a reality. And now the headline is, the digital space is killing brick and mortar. That's just absolutely not true. What's killing brick and mortar is bad brick and mortar. Bad retailers are dying. When was the last time any of us, and I said this the other morning on CBC, when was the last time any of us woke up 
and said, we're excited about going to Toys R Us. <laughs> it's a dump. <laughs> it's a dump. It's not because it's easier to buy a toy. There was a time when my kids were young and the stores were nice that I was excited to go to Toys R Us. But there's an evolution in retail, and it's a natural evolution. And unless you're a really great merchant, you're not going to be a great retailer. And the other thing I said was, and I believe, that Amazon is the best thing that's happened to brick and mortar. And people find that horrifying to say, but it's not. One is all smart online retailers realize they have to have a physical presence. You look at the Warby Parkers, and now you look at Amazon, they're all opening up stores. We announced the Amazon bookstore that's going in the Palisades. One is going in with us down in the marina. We're doing more with them. So the conversion is to what it always was. There was always a dual format of how you sold a product, and you have to be good at both. Whether somebody goes into our Nike store and buys a tennis shoe from the Nike store, or looks at the tennis shoe and goes home and buys it online. I don't care. People say, well, you're losing percentage rent. What I care about is the health and the, the smarts of the retailer. And that's what smart retailers are doing. So brick and mortar for us is fantastic. It's never been healthier. 2016 is our best year ever. 2017 beat 2016. 2018, we're tracking to beat it. If everybody knows how to calculate a Kager, we have had an annual Kager since I started this company of 20%. It's amazing growth. We operate 100% leased. The Grove operates at 2,100 bucks a square foot in sales. The average mall is a little under 400 bucks a square foot in sales. So it's not about brick and mortar. It's about creating an environment that's relevant to the community that you serve, that creates a nice environment around you. None of it is complicated. And it really does go back, I remember when I was a kid, Amazon has an algorithm, right? If you bought this, you'll like this. Everybody thinks that's so genius, and it is. I remember when I was a small kid going with my mom to a department store, and a lady would come out and she'd have her book, and she'd say, Mrs. Crusoe, you know, you were here last month and you bought some really nice cashmere sweaters. If you like those cashmere sweaters, up on the third floor, we got a whole new shipment of cashmere sweaters. That's the same way you sell. And so our job as developers is to create this great environment that connects to our guests and then to select retailers that really know how to be a merchant. And we're not trying to build malls that are a million square feet that you're constantly in the business of just filling space rather than curating space. And so I'm very bullish on brick and mortar. I'm very down on the indoor mall because they just, I'll be, and I hope I don't insult anybody in the room, I probably will. I, I think Century City was such a missed opportunity after a billion and a half dollars to create something that is now reminiscent of a mall when it used to be, when I was younger, one of the great outdoor properties to go hang out. But everybody has a different way of doing it. I wish everybody success and luck, and I find the competition to be fantastic. <laughs> so I really do. I mean that in the best of ways. I think it, it's what get your juices up to be, you know, to be better. But... Uh, when you go to the Palisades, we're reinventing it one more time. Very small, very curated. The whole project of the Palisades is the size of the Hamptons going up at once. It could all fit into the Nordstrom, and it will have more stores than the Grove. <laughs> it's a whole new model, and I'm betting big that it's going to work, um, and I think it will. And we're, we're already about 90% leased, and we're opening at September 22nd. You know, I was in your Tesla store today. I think that's a very interesting model where you've got two Teslas in the showroom, but if you want to buy one, they point you to the computer screen, you go sit down, you order it online. I mean, that's, that's a classic example of really a combination of the technology and the uh, brick and mortar. For me, the missed opportunity is you have one of the all-time great sort of restaurant marketplaces, Italy, based out of Milan, New York, right? I'm not saying I'm right or they're wrong, but if Italy was my tenant, they paid them $30 million to go there. It was in a competition with the Beverly Center. The Lowy's paid him more. I, I wouldn't have put Italy on the third floor in a corner with a separate driveway and separate parking and separate valet. That was done on a spreadsheet. Somebody said, you know what, we can get more GLA and we can build this up on a third floor to make our pro forma look better. I would have taken Italy and put it smack dab in the middle. So after you have a glass of wine at lunch, 
you're a little bit more relaxed, and you start spending more money shopping. I mean, seriously. And it's connected to the movie theater, and it creates a synergy. So, and I think so many of the walkways are covered, and the, the, the face of the buildings, the storefronts are flat, that you don't get the rhythm of great retail when you walk down a street that captures you. And, and they could have accomplished all of that, and then they added a third floor that's mostly vacant. So it's not what I would have done out there, and I, I respect what they've done, but their sales are not proving out that the guest is responding to it. Their daytime population is so strong, the restaurants will do well, because Century City has so many employees. But I'm not sure the shopping is going to have the results that they had hoped for, at least what we're tracking. I could be wrong. Hi, Lap Chief Fan, MRED 2003. I just wanted to ask uh, your opinions of downtown LA for retail and what you've been doing for the Grove and other areas. We've seen a lot of things happen organically in downtown, and then Atlas Capital doing the road DTLA is of the scale of the Grove. Um, how have you approached thinking about downtown LA for yourself? You know, I've looked at it a lot. I feel uh, somewhat guilty that I'm not downtown because I have this great love for Los Angeles and I've been active in Los Angeles politics for since I was 25. And I remember talking to Tom Bradley about downtown and his vision for downtown. So I have a, a long history of it. My hesitation with downtown is this. Um, I ask myself, who's my customer during the day? Who's my customer at night? Who's my customer on the weekends? Who's my customer during the week? And am I going to be able to draw and capture enough customers to drive the kind of sales that we need to drive in order to support the investment that we want to make because we want to build something that's best in class? I haven't figured that out downtown. And I think there's pockets of downtown that have done well. It, it seems like food and beverage downtown is doing well. I don't know the numbers on the retail, so I can't speak you know, to the retail per se. Um, I haven't walked the block yet, um, which I want to do. I know they've had some struggles with the block. So I think it's a little bit hit or miss. But I, what I do love about downtown is the old architecture and what's happening down there. The old Bank of America building. I forget the name of the hotel it is now. No the man. Nomad. Yeah. I walked in there the other night. I was blown away. Uh, it was spectacularly done. The restaurant was packed. There was a great energy. It was Wednesday night. They took advantage of the architecture. You know, what I've told past mayors is take Broadway, turn it into a pedestrian street. I know this sounds corny. Run the trolley down the middle of it. Have a lot of plazas and outdoor dining. Take that grand old architecture and give tax credits to rehabilitate it and create something special. And not sort of do this piecemeal bit. And frankly, and I'll be a little bit politically incorrect here because I don't mind being politically incorrect, you can't have a great downtown if you have to step over these poor homeless people yeah. that need help. And we've got to just say to ourselves, we've got to solve the problem. They should not be living like this, and we should not allow it. And it, that's going to kill the investment downtown. And then the last point, then I'll be quiet. Great downtowns occur because there's investments from many, many sources. When, when it was do predominantly Asian Chinese money going into downtown, it scared the hell out of me. And I told Eric Garcetti that. Because the minute that spigot closes, you're dependent on one source. And now that's what's happened. So I just, it, I would have looked at it differently. But based on what's happening right now, I would not go downtown because I don't think downtown has the same resources it needs to support what I would want to do um, in a project. And there's, there's not enough I can control down there to create my own energy, which is what we've done on our properties. So that's a long-winded story, but it pains me because I think it should be great. LA deserves a great downtown. I think you're going to see downtown. We, we've got two teams down there that are very active. I don't know if Derek Moore is still here, um, but Derek's one of, the, one of the guys on the team. And I, I can tell you that there is every retailer looking downtown. It, I agree with Rick, though. It, the, the homeless issue has got to get fixed uh, because it's chasing people away. It's going to hurt the residential. It's going to hurt the retail. It's going to hurt the office. And so we've got one half of 1% of our population in this condition that's unsheltered. 
and yet we've got the most creative and the most financially sound economy in the world in Los Angeles, and we haven't been able to figure this out. I know Nadine is chairing a group that's actually focused on this, but it's something that we've got to fix, and it's got to be this combination, not just our electeds, but it's got to be a part of the private world that's actually helping get this done. But that's going to be, that's the hole in the boat. I don't think it's that tough to fix. Wait, wait, it's not that tough to fix. I, wait, I what? I, I think you've just got to make some, you got to be bold, you got to make some decisions, and you don't have to, and don't worry about getting reelected. Just do the right thing. Just do the right thing. I mean, it, you know, it's just generally my opinion of elected officials, and I'm not talking about anyone in particular, but the, the fear of getting, not getting reelected, and actually having to work for a living and, you know, sign the front of a check, get used to that has impaired our ability. We used to have a city council with some great leaders that took some bold moves. And we, I think we have a good city council now, but term limits create a whole bunch of havoc. And you remember, Roger, back in the day when you had the Gil Lindsay's and the John Ferraris and the Tom Bradley's, they didn't have to worry about this constant term limit. Um, so it's just, it's a spiral effect. And I think it's, you know, look what Bloomberg did for New York. Mm -hmm. And that was a city that had terrible homeless issues and terrible crime issues. But he had the boldness to make some big decisions. And it really propelled that city forward. And I think LA, we all as residents and investors in LA, we should demand that this homeless issue just get fixed. I think there's also some, there's enforcement issues too. That we've got some bad law in the books. Because we've got issues now where there's capacity, the judges are saying, well, if you can't house these people, then we're gonna protect their stuff, we're gonna protect their tent. And now all of a sudden you've got a situation where that's an alternative way to live. Yeah. So you've got a guy on the street that's gonna get $450 a, you know, a month on his card, and if I live in my tent, I don't have to follow a rule. If I go to Union Risky, Rescue, I've gotta actually follow rules. And so all of a sudden we've got an alternative style here because of the lack of enforcement. So I think, I think it's gonna be a combination of building capacity and also going back and taking a revisit of those laws. And there's three of them. The question is how is uh, our new light rail system and I guess heavy rail including the underground uh, impacting what you do? I, I think the rail system is great. We need to get more cars off the road. I, I don't build a project looking at the adjacency to the light rail or the heavy rail or the underground. I just don't. I look at the demographics. I look at a whole bunch of things. The rail helps. It's nice. I think the game changer is going to be driverless. And I, I think, um, you know, one of the things as a sort of a city government you got to ask yourself is, do you continually invest billions of dollars into rail when you're going to have a driverless system that will probably convert to buses that don't need that kind of capital investment and can be running all over the place, right? And more and more people, you know, the question for us is, is our revenue in the Grove and the parking structure gonna go down because there's more driverless cars in the next five years? And the answer is probably gonna be yes. It's gonna be a huge benefit to us in our suburban properties that have at grade parking because we're gonna get real estate back at no cost to develop because we'll need less parking. So it's gonna be an interesting you know, evolution that's going on here, which I find fascinating. And from a technology standpoint, we're making the investment to get ready for it. But you know, it's like when we built this project, there wasn't anything called Uber. And now our valet areas are jammed because of Uber. This is the number one drop off in LA County, is the Grove. And the Uber drop off went up 400% last year. We're not designed for that. You go to the Palisades, we have separate Uber drop off now. So you know, you try to get ahead of these curves, but I think the driverless car is going to be the big game changer. Gensler's actually designing the new parking structures so that they're flat instead of uh, tilted so that you can actually convert over to a residential or to a retail or office site. We're actually selling a site right now, a parking structure in downtown LA. It's owned by Rob McGuire, and it's, it's being sold to convert to office and retail on the bottom. It's a parking structure. That sounds like a good story. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. I'll scoop you. Wait, I got to get an escrow <laughs> I first. You like that, didn't you? I, I, did. well, I think you told me what you were going to do, what, what you might do with your parking structures here. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what could, if you don't need these parking structures, what would happen? Well, we would have to take this structure down. I mean, it's not, you can't convert it. It's post tension. The floor to ceiling is not 
you know, high enough. You know, maybe there's a use. I don't know. I um, we're going to work damn hard to keep it full to start, um, but um, it's just not designed for that kind of conversion. So if Gensler's doing this, ours is flat also with the Helix ramp. I'm not quite sure the floor to floor is going to be very usable with an upturned beam. It's a little bit more complicated. Yeah. So would you put it in a grocery store if you took it down, or what would you do? If I took that down, what would I put there? As a retailer, what would I put there? I couldn't put a grocery store in there because I have an agreement with Hank Hilty. I won't compete with the farmer's market. Uh -huh. So the farmer's market is effectively our grocery store. So I wouldn't do that. But there's a lot of great retailers um, that we'd, we'd like to have at the Grove, and we don't have the space to have at the Grove. So I'm pretty confident we'd, we'd find a good use for it. My name is uh, Brent Musson. Um, I'm a Price uh, graduate, also a Marshall graduate. Um, and uh, I have a, a really interesting question. By the way, I also took a, cl a class from uh, Brett Nielsen. Ah, um, great, great guy. Great guy. I asked him this question, so now I'll ask you. Um, what you have here is sort of an ideal city environment, like a little microcosm of an ideal city. Mm -hmm. You have uh, beautiful roads and, and lampposts and so forth. And uh, the Americana kind of shows that people really would just love, kind of love to live here and walk these streets on a daily basis. Um, what is stopping you from actually moving into a neighborhood, buying up property and converting real streets to be more idyllic um, and, and create idyllic neighborhoods rather than an idyllic replica of a neighborhood? That's a great question. We, we had a big executive, we do these executive retreats and you know what businesses should we be in, what other projects should we be doing, those kind of things. We spent a day talking about with some of the senior executives. Uh, and it was never positioned that way. It was more, you know, would we be interested in doing sort of a planned community and take something from scratch? And the answer is yes. The challenge, and I would love to pursue this more and learn. If you have any ideas, I'd love to learn from you about it, is can you end up buying enough that you can control it, right? That would be the issue. And, um, but I think it would be fantastic to do something like that. And, uh, but you're right, we, we're in the business of creating an environment that when you step onto the property, in some form or fashion, you're transported to a better time and place that just sort of calms you down a little bit and you enjoy it. And we don't try to sell too hard or any of that kind of stuff, so you create this environment. To do that in a full community would be um, amazing to do. It would be incredible. And I would tell you, Palisades, to some extent is like that in a small way in that we're able to redevelop the whole downtown. So we are going to be the downtown effectively. And, and that's sort of been a cool thing. And it, you also have to assume a lot of responsibility when you do that because you want to get it right. But if you have an idea of how to do it or where to do it, um, I'd love to hear about it. It's a great question. What's that? OK, you got a deal. I'd love to hear about it. You know, there's a few Price alumni, recent graduates as myself and students like my sister that are aspiring developers. And I know you said that law school was the best way to, I guess, get that background. But what would, what would be a tip if we didn't go to law school, some tips to become those aspiring developers that we all want to be like yourself? You know, I, I would just go out and do it. I know it sounds crazy. I, I would break rules. I, I would get out of uh, the bunker of thinking. I'd, um, I'd make some mistakes. I'd learn from it. But I would go back to what I did with this duplex. I had no idea what I was doing. And um, there's, and I talk about this in the company a lot. There was a time in this company that I really miss. And that's when we couldn't afford to do what we wanted to do. So we couldn't afford to make a mistake. We couldn't afford to waste time. You know, we had to get something leased. It was this urgency and this fire in your belly waking up every morning. And every day, I try to reinfuse that in the company because I think as you grow, sometimes you get a little bit complacent, you know. And a bit of desperation uh, creates a lot of wonderful things. And so I would just get over your skis and go do it. And if it doesn't work, you'll course correct and you'll figure it out. Thank you. Don't go work for an indoor mall company. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank our Price Real Estate alumni and affiliates for putting this event together. And 
Thank you, Rick, for your incredible hospitality. I hope everybody got some popcorn and Coke. Uh, I certainly did. And uh, I also um, want to uh, encourage our guests in attendance to thank you for coming. Uh, we hope you'll consider joining the Price School of Real Estate Alumni and Affiliates in the future.